Good morning, everyone. Today we read the book of First Samuel, first chapter twelve, first one to twelve. It's the first section. Samuel's address at Saul's coronation. Now, first thirteen to fifteen. God's warning, and then sixteen to the end. That's God's discipline. So let's first look at the first section. Now Samuel said to all Israel, "Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. And now he is the king, walking before you. And I am old and grey-headed. And look, your, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. Here I am." Witness against me before the Lord and before His anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I cheated, whom have I oppressed, or from whose hand have I received any bride with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, You have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said to them, The Lord is witness against. Against you and has anointed as witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. So that was Saul's coronation. They were to go up to the throne, and the people rejoiced greatly. Uh, that was after a great victory. It should be a great climax. At that time, Samuel came to give a speech. That was a special occasion. All the Israelites might be so they may so be so excited, expecting Samuel to give a great speech. Today, I want you to imagine. I look from a perspective. You, if you were Saul, how would you feel? Because this is very important. This will affect Saul's life. So, who was supposed to be the main character in the coronation? Saul. He was going to be the king, and Samuel would officiate the ceremony. Just imagine. In your most important moment, and he asks someone so important to come to be the MC. But then the MC, once he stepped on the stage, he, he spoke such things. How would you feel? Actually, was not related to what Samuel said. Not related to Saul, as if Samuel didn't see. Saul, forget about Saul. The first thing he said was, "Indeed, I have heeded your voice in all that you said to me, and have made king, a, made a king over you." That was still fine. And then he said, "And now, I'm old and grey-headed, and look, my sons are with you. My whole family are before you." And he said, "I've walked before you from my childhood to this day, in front of God's anointed. Be a witness for me." The speech seems like Samuel's retirement speech. He said, "I'm old." Before I retire, let me ask you something. Whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I cheated, whom have I oppressed, or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? He said, "If so, I will restore it to you." I will give that back to you. And the people said, "You have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand." So that was like、um, Samuel was confirmed innocent, and 
his integrity was affirmed by everyone. He served for his old, whole life when he was old. He did not take anything for his own selfish gain. He did not take any bribe. He was honest and walked before Israel uprightly. And then Samuel said, Now with the anointed of God, so be witnessed. And then verse 6, Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. And then Samuel said, change the topic, he said. God raised up Moses and Aaron and let you out of Egypt. So let me reason with you before the coronation. I want to tell you what is righteous. And everyone must be kind of shocked and surprised. It was supposed to be a very happy moment, and then the whole atmosphere changed. It's like, why did you mention about God and, and tell us about the his, our history? And Samuel was old. Sometimes we don't uh, like it that old man start to share from his childhood. There'll be a long history to listen to. And he started from the time of Egypt. So, so what's that about? Everyone was concerned. And then Samuel said, I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. So before the coronation of the king, Samuel came. He was really a faithful servant. He said, I wanted to give God justice. So, Samuel wanted the Israelites to see clearly what's happening. What is it that you're doing? Is it just to God? And then let's see what we shall do. First, eight. When Jacob had gone into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. So the whole incident started from Jacob going down to Egypt. It was a glorious time, but then they became slaves, and so the ancestors cried out to God. And what, how did that happen? Because your fathers cried out to God. And God sent Moses and Aaron to lead your fathers out of Egypt. So when the Israelites cried out to God, God responded. And then let the ancestors out of Egypt. Verse 9. And when they forgot, the Lord the God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hassel, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. So God let them out of Egypt and led them to this place to live, but they forgot about God. God helped them so they could leave the place of slavery. He gave them a land, but they forgot about God. They didn't give thanks to God. They departed from God. And so God left them. And these nations rose up. And God gave them to into the hand 
of Sisarad, commander of the army of Hazel, God wanted to bring his people into Canaan. And actually, the messenger went ahead of the Israelites and fought for them. So that all the enemies flee before them. But the Israelites abandon God, they forgot about God, they forsook God, and so God sold them into the hand of Assyria, which means he just gave up on them. God had a plan to send his army in but as he looked back, the Israelites forgot about God, and so God said, I will not fight for you. And so God let them be. God said, I'm not going to fight for you, you face them alone. You don't want my help. Okay, we said it. We agreed that we we'll go together, but you broke the you have broken the covenant. Okay. All right, you do it yourself. I won't care. I'll let you be. So when God left, Caesarea, the Philistines, and the Moabites overcame the Israelites. They came to attack Israel, Israel often. So who started this bad cycle? It was not God. God did, was not. Wow, God is always just and righteous. So Samuel wanted to give God the justice. You have ended up in this place because of your own faults. Every battle, um, when you won a battle, it was because of God's help. In the city of Jericho, it was God who pushed down the city wall. Otherwise, you would not have won. So, they became victorious and earned more, occupied more land because of God's help. God gave you the vineyard, the farmland, which is half as from the land. Everything is given to you from God. But you have abandoned God. So God would ignore you now. Otherwise, um, it's, it's like you saying to your father, I don't need you, I can do it myself. And then the father will, will just let you be. Okay, fine, let you be. Let you make your own mistake, and then you may return. It's the same with God. God just let go and let them be, and the enemies grows up. And so, verse 10, now it happened that soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him, that he might so the Israelites cry out to God when they cannot overcome the enemies and they say we have sinned we have worshipped idols and Ashtoreths and we have sinned against you so now save us from the enemies we will serve you and they apologize and they back God and then verse 11 Samuel and then um, so God sent them help. The Lord sent Jerobel, Bidan, Jephan, and Samuel and delivered you out of the land of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And so every time when the Israelites went out, uh, cried out to God, God delivered them. God answered their prayer. God answered the cry. So you see, whatever God said, Samuel said the same. He didn't make a discount of God's word. Samuel stood on the side of God. He didn't look at himself. 
Samuel really was a representative of God. So the Israelites, they were um, facing God. These words were not from Samuel himself. It was the words from God. It's hard. And when Samuel said such a speech, he was presented God. These words were from God's heart. And, and Israelites must feel that, oh, I, we have been wrong. And they couldn't lift up their head to face God. He said, when you betray God, when you left God, abandoned God, but as long as you returned, God still saved you from your enemies. And you can dwell in safety. We can have a peace today because God has risen up the judges to save you. Otherwise, how would you have safety and peace? How could you overcome your enemies? So the Israelites must have recalled the battle of the Ebenezer. Otherwise, all the Israelites would have been killed. And this happened not so long ago. So through Samuel, God really saved the Israelites. And when he mentions Samuel, salvation, it was something really fresh that happened not too long ago. Every time it was like that, it was like a cycle. God intervened and helped them, and there was peace, and then they abandoned God, and then there was trouble and enemies. So Samuel mentioned about Jerobel, Beden, Jonathan, and Samuel, just four judges uh, that came earlier. So Samuel was actually telling the Israelites it happened every time. It was the same. You got saved, you got helped, and you forgot about God. And then you mess up, and then you turn to God, and then God help you again. I am a witness. I, am, I was the fourth judge mentioned here. It's still the same. Verse 12. And when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. You see, the Ammonites came. He said, There must be a king over us. But actually, the Lord your God was your king. But do you really see that God is your king? When you choose a king, when you want a king over you, that means you're rejecting God as your king. That's the greatest problem be behind the coronation of a king. It's the rejection of God himself. So Samuel clarified clearly here, the Lord your God was your king. Because every time when the Israelites cried to God, God responded, Why do you want a king to reign over you? How would a king rule over you? They said, When you have a request to come before the king, the king will answer you. When you don't have food or job, then the king will help you with his policy. That's the king. So you want a king because the king can respond to you like that. When the enemies come, the king will fight for you, will defend you. That was what the king did in the ancient times. And the 
King would bring in peace to the country so he can live in peace. When the enemies come, the king will take the army out to defend you, protect you. And that's why you give pay tax and tributes to the king. The Asian kings would protect you and you just pay a tax just like you're paying a peace safety insurance. And God has been doing this to you. God has been answering you, protecting you, leading you, and giving you peace in your country, and even giving you abundance, which king on earth is like this, or is better than him. And then Samuel mentioned it in the last chapter, that we compare God and the king, the king will oppress you more because he would take your horses and and lambs and calves and your children will do have to do work for him and would take your soldiers uh, uh, take your strong men as soldiers your children have to serve him but God did not ask you to do this he just asked you to give a tithing to his house the storehouse and then go up to his temple three times a year to give an offering to worship him. This king is actually asking less things from you, but he's giving you more things. And what's most special from this king is that he give you 10 out of 10 and asks you only for 1 out of 10. Actually, this father gives you the money first. So Samuel presented all this clearly to the Israelites and asked them, is this fair? And he said, what you're doing is really unfair and rebellious. You're betraying God. God has been your king since you left the land of Egypt. And God has been Israelite king until today. And now you're saying that you want to have another king on behalf of the heavenly king? So that was the picture. And then first 13, the second section. And these was shown before the Israel that people were silent. And then Samuel gave them a warning on behalf of God. He said, Now, therefore, he's a king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And then, so Samuel suddenly pointed to Saul and said, Now, he is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the, your king is here. So, must be very fearful from the heart. How can we face God? Suddenly, Samuel pointed to Saul and said, This is the king you want. Okay, take it. Take him. And verse 14 If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his force and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the force of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. So if you're willing to follow God after having this king, if, you're, if you and your king obey the Lord, okay, then that's fine. Let it be. God let you go. God will not uh, come after you. But you and your king must listen and obey the force of the Lord. Do not rebel against God's commandments. Just follow him. Otherwise, if you disobey his commandments, the Lord's hand will attack you as it was against your father. So learn from history. If you wake up today and follow him, then it's fine. But if you still continue to rebel against God, and God will ignore you. You end up like your ancestors, your fathers. Yeah. 
背叛神嘅時候，都會另攬個王嚟代替神。你而家就係喺你個喺你列祖述嘅衰嘢上面再添多一筆，即係衰仲未夠衰，仲要再加多一腳。No. 咁你好似為智能，係咪？對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，以色列人聽到呢度，對啦，Are the Israelites shaken? Have they woken up? Uh, they may be thinking, "Is God really like this? Is He so angry like what you said?" So Samuel showed the people truly the heavenly King is like this. Everything that Samuel said represented God. This is what God sees and thinks. God wants justice, but of course, behind that is God's love. Because God reveals Himself like this to shake the Israelites so that they can fear God and know that God is really true and living God, and help them to know that God is the. King, every time they cry out to God, God answer them. Every time the same. Verse seventeen. Is today not the wheat harvest? I call to the Lord, and He will send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking a king for yourselves. Samuel said, "Isn't now the time for wheat harvest in Israel? It was." It's not possible to have rain during the wheat harvest season. It's very hard to rain, especially in the dry season. That's impossible. Besides, I'm telling you, tomorrow I want the sun to rise up from the west. How could that be? It's never seen such a thing after thousands of years. The sun always rises from the east. Of course, that's an ana analogy. I've never seen that. My ancestors have not seen the rain during the dry season. So Samuel said, if it does rain during the dry season, then you will know that this is from God, because you have sinned against God. Greatly, it's a time when if it rains during the wheat harvest, then they will lose all their harvest. Basically, the rains will destroy the harvest, and their labor would have been wasted in that year. So, if that happens, that's a great discipline. Showing people that God's in control of everything, even the rain and thunder is in God's hand. Verse eighteen. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So as soon as Samuel. Spoke after he prayed, and then the same time, God sent thunder and rain. So everyone was terrified. The coronation became such an occasion, and so all the people greatly feared the Lord. And Samuel, and they said to Samuel, "Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins the evil, asking a king for ourselves." As we mentioned, they were worse than the ancestors. They added one more thing, one more sin, which was asking for. A king. They woke up and so they asked Samuel to to pray to 
yoga. So that's another problem. It's not my God, our God. It's your God. Samuel said they asked Samuel to pray to your God. Because they saw that they really have sinned greatly, worse than their ancestors. So we know now, pray for us. So that was like a really, they were really guilty. They felt guilty. And then, but then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear, you have done all these wickednesses. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart and do not turn aside, for then you will go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it, it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. You see how deeply the Samuel loved the people, he had great mercy for them. It's like he hit on their palm, but then when they f felt painful and returned, and then you see the mercy of Samuel. Even though you have done this great wickedness, you have hurt God deeply, but God says it's fine. As long as you turn to me with all your heart, and God will forgive them. But I do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. What does it mean not to turn aside from following the Lord? As long as you keep this relationship, then I, I let it go. I will cancel your debts. I will not count your sins. As long as you treat me as your God and keep this relationship. But if you turn aside, if you go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, Samuel was representing God to speak to the people, but now he was like a parent teaching his children. It's really true. Do not pursue these empty things. They are not profitable for you. Right now I'm old. I can see everything clearly in life. My child, do not pursue the empty gods. They are not profitable for you. They are nothing. For the Lord would not forsake his people because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people get to know the Lord. Samuel knew about new God, and so he said, God is pleased to make you his people, so God will not forsake you. God has been merciful and loving to you. He will not change his love towards you. He has chosen you as his people. He will love you to the end. So God values the people God has given his name to the Israelites. God has bound his own name with the Israelites. You cannot separate you and me and me and you. So God surely will treasure you and love you. So you should stay alert and keep following him. And then he said, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Even God doesn't, if God is not pleased with me, I will still pray for you. If God doesn't want me to pray for you, I will still pray for you. And I will teach you the good and the right way. Samuel has not thought about retiring. And his opening speech was just to wake up the Israelites. Samuel said, I will not let you go. I will not give up on you. 
I will help you surely and show you the right way. Consider what great things he has done for you. Think about his grace. I will always remind you to recall God's grace. And if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. If you continue to harden your hearts, then you and your king will perish. So the, this chapter ends and the coronation ended here. The Bible shows me today what's most pitiful is that Saul did not speak a word when Samuel said, if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. If Saul would come out and say, because he's a king, he represents all the Israelites to take up their responsibility. If he would come out to say to Samuel and God and, and say, we have sinned against you greatly from this day on, I so will lead all the people to, to worship God as our king. I am the king, but I proclaim God is our God. I will serve him all my life. Samuel, help me. If this would have been spoken, the whole history would have been changed. But here we see that Saul did not stand up to take up the responsibility of the king to lead the Israelites to return to God. So actually you can see that Saul, he followed his kingship, his throne. Samuel has already made it so clear he gave justice back to God and this new king he did not even speak when he was being enthroned. So today what do we value in our life? Do we have such faith and courage to tell God, I am the king in this place, but you are my king. I will worship you as my king. You are the true king. Everything I have belongs to you. I will love you with all my heart and to serve you and follow you with all my heart. May we all have such a heart so that our lives will be different. Amen. No, but may all the praise and glory be to you. Today, this morning, we come before you. We offer the greatest praise to you, thanksgiving to you. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for your love for us. You never give up on us. You are the covenant keeping God. And you is full of grace. Lord, as we reflect and recall and read the scripture, you can see the Israelites again and again. They have committed the same mistake they have done. But then your salvation also repeats. Reveal yourself. So in our lives, we may also make a lot of mistakes repeatedly, but we see your hand saving us step by step, so that today we come before you to reflect and give thanks in our life because of our rebellion and stubbornness. A low self-esteem. We made a lot of wrong decisions. So we have made a lot of troubles. But Lord, you have been saving us and leading us. So let's reflect. We call God's salvation step by step. Every time as we encounter difficulties, choices or changes, do we make, think of our own ways and solutions or the worldly ways? That this may be easier, maybe more familiar, 
more confident. That's the way we used to resolving problems and making choices. But God, do we come before you to seek you? Do we come before you and rely on you? Will we come before you and we seek you and rely on you? We believe that you will save us and give us strategy to help us. Maybe as you give us a strategy, we're still planning and plotting in our lives, calculating in our hearts the strategy, comparing you with my own thought or the worldly strategy. Are they contradicting if it's different? And how do we choose? Lord, help us. Shine your light in us, Holy Spirit, help us. Shine your light into our hearts. What is my thought? Is it godly thought? Or a worldly thought? And maybe just get my goal, attain my goal. I will take all means. Lord, shine your light in me again. Help us. So we can reflect again in you because you are covenant keeping God. Even though we have weaknesses and we have made mistakes, but we know that every time you hold our hands. You wait for us when we're willing to return. And go back to you, always help us. Please come to us with your smile so we can return to you. And I, as I pray, I hear God saying to every one of us, My child, return to me. Even though we have taken a lot of unnecessary detours and use our own ways to attain what we want. I hear God says, return to me, even though some brothers and sisters says, oh, I almost have the success. Actually, God is the only help and savior. The world can give you a temporary success, but here God says to you, I prepare for you to have an eternal victory. I want to give eternal victory. Return to God again so God can help us. Just like in our life, every difficulty, every problem, God is willing to help us so we can overcome and be victorious. I hear God says, my child, return to me. I want you to be victorious. Lord, I thank you. Uh, reminding us through the scripture today. Always waiting for us to return to you. And you always give us a chance so we can follow you closely. Your only demand for us is not to depart from you. Lord, thank you that your love never leaves us or forsakes us because 
You are covenant keeping God. Take away all our guilt and self condemnation. So it's bad to return now. After so long, the Lord take away our self condemnation and guilt, because you said your only request demand is that every child will return back to you completely and not leave you, not forsake you. So Lord, help us to choose to return to you again, to follow you closely. Lord, I thank you. You are the one who loves us and give us mercy. Let us make decision to return to you. So your sufficient and power will come to us and lead us again to face every obstacle, and challenge, and difficulty, and help us to make every choice in the future because we know that. We follow you. You love us as our Father God. You give us the best blessing. Thank you, Jesus. I give thanks to you. I give thanks again to come before you. Just like the scriptures. Let us learn to meditate. Do not follow King Saul. When Samuel, oh God, give us a, a chance again and again. Do not choose like Saul to be silent. We don't want to be like Saul. To be calculative. To be. Greedy for the kingship, to just be greedy for the temporary success or the temporary profits. Lord, we know that as you call us, we respond to you. Stand on the position as priest. Lord, you have chosen us as priest. We have a position. Let's choose to stand on the position as a priest. To pray for Hong Kong and the whole world as a priest. Lord, we come before you. We use our identity and position as a priest to intercede for Hong Kong and the whole world. Lord, we return to you. Let us all return to you. Because of our faults or our weaknesses, to run away from you. Because we know our weaknesses and incapabilities. Despite that, we can still return to come to you to rely on you. So, I invite you to pray for Hong Kong. Lord, I thank you. Pray for the pandemic of Hong Kong. It has been affecting us for over a year. A lot of professions have been affected, and if we close down because of the pandemic, it's the same as church. We cannot have on. On-site meetings and a lot of、uh, restaurants and venues have to close down. And has given us pressure because of the restriction. In terms of our functioning, a lot of businesses have closed down. The cinemas, gyms. Lord, we ask for your protection for the church, so we can have peace and have faith to know that you have saved us. You will help us so that we can resume on-site worship soon. Together in your temple to worship together, so that we know. That 
It's different to worship together in terms of the warmth, the temperature, the passion. So we come before you, standing in the position as a priest. May you help us, heal us, stop the plagues. So the COVID-19 not destroy us. You help us. Healing comes to us. So Hong Kong can return to its normal functioning according to God's will. Lord, help us. We want to return you and we stand in position as priests to intercede for Hong Kong. Let your glory and your power and your grace and your love be revealed on earth. We can experience your love and presence. We can follow you closely, not depart from you. Lord, I thank you and praise you. Let Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, B. When the Lord, the Lord your God, is your King, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. This is Samuel's proclamation, and that's a reminder of God to His people. To today, we also need to remember this. Lord, your God is your King. Fear Him. Serve Him in truth with all your heart, and consider what great things He has done for you. Always we call what God has done so we can stay in humility and know that God is our King. He's not just our God, He's our King. He's given us abundant profession. He's the King. So today we need to count God's grace. God has done great things among us in new crop, has kept us peace and provided for us. In our anniversary, there was He opened a window for us so we could have a one-year anniversary in Western Market. The time just fit. And God has been providing for us. So co-workers need to look for an apartment or school. Everything is smooth according to God's perfect timing. God is with us. He is our God. He is our King. So let's count, recall, and give thanks, meditate, so that we don't forget our God, our King. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. The Holy Spirit come to us. In Jesus' name, I ask the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts. Open our eyes so that we call and see how God is providing for us and leading us to go forward even though there are difficulties God has helped us to overcome has given us joy and peace Lord may you open our eyes so we can humbly come before you our spiritual eyes can be opened and see that the Lord our God is our King Jesus name I put this word into everyone's spirit and heart deeply the Lord your God is your King as long as you fear him serve him in all truth and consider what great things he has done for you 
Jesus name I put this word in your spirit to be your help and reminder so we can hold on to him follow him closely in God's mercy and love will always be with us. Lord, we thank you. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Good morning devotion will end here. May the Lord bless you.